Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. On July 12, 2022, NASA released a series of incredible images from its James Webb Space Telescope. They are astounding and awe-inspiring and a marvel of human accomplishment. The Webb Telescope is really cool. It launched in 2021 and is in second Lang range or L2 orbit about a million miles from the Earth. It's out there because it's cold. Infrared interference caused by light from the sun reflected off the Earth and Moon would warm the telescope and result in lower quality images. But with heat shields in place, and it's back to the inner solar system, we get something truly amazing. Two things that I love about this. First is the memes. They are spectacular. But next, we get some points of comparison and we can see how far technology has come. Images from the Hubble telescope in low Earth orbit can be overlaid on top of the web images. Further, the exposure time of the web images in L2 takes far less time than the Hubble ones. I, like many, am very excited to see what scientists can learn from this. In just a few hundred years, we have gone from imprisoning people for thinking the sun is the center of the universe, our bad Galileo, to being able to see an estimated billions of years into the past. From early history, people made distinct connections between the divine and what they saw in the sky, the observable wisdom of the universe. Many of the early astronomers come from religious backgrounds. There are a couple reasons for that, I think. One is the religious component, the other is just specialization of labor. If religion views the stars as having divine meaning, it makes sense for a priest or a holy man to make and log observations about the night sky. Over time, those observations might become useful. In societies with large-scale agriculture, like the River Valley civilizations, it makes much less sense for a farmer to do the same. And it does seem relatively obvious that to some degree ancient man was paying attention. Megaliths like Stonehenge, the Giant Serpent Mound, and the Great Pyramids appear to be attached to astronomical alignments, but there are smaller things that are much older than those. In 1979, a carving from a mammoth tusk was found in Germany. Apparently Germany had mammoths. It shows a figure that likely represents the constellation Orion. It curiously includes 87 tick marks and is estimated to be between 32 and 38,000 years old. At the time the artifact was made, the constellation's brightest star would have been invisible from the location from where it was found for 87 days out of the year. A German researcher named Michael Rappenkluck theorized those 87 ticks represented a fertility window to keep track of when was the ideal time to have a child. If a child was conceived in those 87 days, it would be a newborn in winter, a slow time for hunter-gatherers. If the child was born in other seasons, the mother would have to be on the move almost directly after giving birth. The tusk is some 16,000 years older than a possible star chart found in Francis Lasco Cave. In this cave are paintings that include constellations like Pieties, the Summer Triangle, and Orion's Belt. Similar 14,000-year-old paintings have been found in Spain and other caves. Rappengluck, mentioned earlier, described them as a map of the prehistoric cosmos. Ancient people were able to use the cycles of the moon in order to create a yearly calendar. A moon cycle is roughly 29 and a half days. 12-month lunar calendars were developed with months generally alternating between 29 and 30 days, pretty close to the size of the months that we have now. The problem becomes is that after 12 months, you have gone 354 days, not the 365 that we now use in our solar calendar. If you went solely by the lunar calendar, every year you would move the seasons by roughly 11 days. In three years, July would essentially become June, and in 18 years, July would become January. But ancient people, very clever, had a solution. In 1999, archaeologists discovered an artifact called the Nebra Sky Disk in Germany. This neat thing is about a foot in diameter and maps 32 stars, including the Seven Sisters star cluster. It's also called the Taurus constellation and Pleiades. We saw the same constellation in the cave wall in France. This disk includes a lot of aspects and also an obvious sun and moon. The theory is, is that it let people know when to synchronize their lunar and solar calendar. When the three-day-old crescent moon, the one that's seen on the disk, is visible at the same time as the Seven Sisters, they would note and insert a leap month every three years. This would keep the lunar calendar in alignment with the solar year. The disk is dated to 1800 BC, that's 3800 years ago, and around 1600 BC it was intentionally buried and scientists really have no idea why, but they did find some dope swords with it. Like the Niebuhr Sky Disk, early agricultural societies from all around the world made all sorts of advancements. The Mesopotamians logged astrological observations in cuneiform as far back as 1200 BC. Babylonian astronomers will even theorize the sun as the center of the universe 2100 years ago, something Europe will be fighting about much, much later. Their observations will lead to the base number 60 number system. We use it today to divide circles into 360 degrees and hours into 60 minutes. It turns out that 60 is very divisible. 
The Greek, Eratosthenes, by observing the sun and shadows from different locations, worked out the circumference of the Earth to within a couple hundred miles using the number system developed by the Babylonians. That will also lead to the use of inventions like the astrolobe and sextant as navigational tools. Fun fact, ancient people didn't actually think the Earth was flat. At least not most of them. If they were using constellations to figure out fertility, they were probably going to notice in the Mediterranean when a ship's hull sinks out of view before the mast. They could also see. The moon is round. The sun is round. And when there is a lunar eclipse, they could see the shadow of the Earth is also round. Flat Earthers will say that I am a round Earth shill, but I am willing to take on that burden. Speaking of eclipses, ancient societies got so good at astrological observation that many, including the Greeks, Indians, Chinese, and Mayans, were even able to predict them. One of the big tragedies of the early Spanish conquest in the Americas, and there are many, was that the Spanish burned most of the written works of the Mayans. Their work was so accurate that one book that survived, the Dresden Codex, was used to accurately predict when eclipses would take place in the 1980s and 1990s. The book itself was written 900 or so years before that. And I don't know if this is true, but it's been speculated that the Mayans had knowledge of these eclipses before planning religious festivals. Remember that scene in Apocalypto, with the heads rolling down the temple steps as they conduct a mass sacrifice? It stopped when a eclipse signals to them that the gods are pleased with their sacrifice. What that's supposed to represent is that the Mayans may have planned events like this knowing that an eclipse would happen, almost as if it was a theater production. If ancient people could predict eclipses, it's not surprising that the old lunar calendars of our ancestors were eventually replaced with extremely accurate solar calendars, including the Gregorian calendar that we still use today. However, that won't be adopted until 1582. A big problem in early astronomy had to deal with figuring out whether the universe was geocentric or heliocentric. Geocentrism places Earth at the center of the solar system, or what they would have thought of as the universe, whereas heliocentrism places the sun at the center. People worked out a lot of complex problems, but this one gave them an especially hard time. The Babylonians and the Greeks actually suggested heliocentrism over 2,000 years ago, but people really had a hard time buying in. Most people would say that that was because of religion, but it's actually kind of a problem in physics. When we move, we can feel it, and Isaac Newton's laws of motion don't exist before the 1600s. So the idea that we are hurling around the sun at incomprehensible speeds and couldn't tell seemed like a tough pill to swallow. It made a lot more sense to people that we were stationary and the universe was moving around us. The geocentric model is very strange. Because of planetary eclipses, where Mercury and Venus pass in front of the sun, it was thought that the Earth was in the center and orbiting around it was Mercury and Venus, followed then by the sun, then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uranus and Neptune are not visible yet because they are far away and telescopes don't exist until 1608. We are jumping ahead a little bit, but Nicholas Copernicus started the shift of thought toward heliocentrism in the early 1500s, but a bunch of scientists after that are going to build on his work. Of them, Galileo Galilei. He will be influenced by Copernicus and Tycho Brahe, and with the use of the newly invented telescope, was able to make some observations that will destroy the geocentric model, but they will make him very popular with the church. His observations included sunspots, what the surface of the moon was like, and what the stars of the Milky Way looked like but two other observations are really important to me. One is the phases of Venus. Because of its position in the universe, Venus goes through phases like the moon, where at some points it is nearly fully visible and at other points it is not. There are shadows and they are relative to the planet's position to the sun. What is noticeable though, is that Venus appears much larger when it's in its new moon phase, in front of the sun, as opposed to when it's behind the sun. That, and the fact that Venus is always right next to the sun, tells us that it's orbiting it. Some goofy geocentric models actually account for that by having the Earth at the center of the universe, but both Venus and Mercury orbit the Sun. But then there's Jupiter. With the aid of the telescope, Galileo could see Jupiter's moons, moons that clearly orbit the giant planet. Galileo can now prove that not everything has to orbit the center of the universe, they can orbit objects around them. If Jupiter's moons can orbit Jupiter, then our moon can orbit us, and like Venus, we can all orbit the Sun. Very strangely, there was a Chinese astronomer who wrote about Jupiter's moons in the 4th century BC. Problem was is that you can't see them without a telescope, so no one really knows how he did it. For Galileo, two additional problems came up. One is religion. Heliocentrism went against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. We can't have that. So naturally, in 1633, Galileo is charged with heresy, his book is banned, and he died under house arrest in 1642. The second problem is physics. Why do some things orbit other things? Enter Isaac Newton. In a minute. There are many notable people that I have breezed over, including, prior to the Renaissance in the 10th century Middle East, Abu Muhammad al-Qajandi. He figured out the Earth's tilt. 
In the early 1600s, Johannes Kepler figured out that the planets moved in elliptical orbits and not perfectly round ones. But Isaac Newton figured out why. Newton in the 1680s developed the law of universal gravitation, the laws of motion, and to the chagrin of students everywhere, calculus. For gravitation, the larger the mass, the greater the force of attraction. You can enter the yo mama joke of your choosing. What it means is that the Earth can have a moon, but we can all orbit the Sun because the Sun is much, much bigger. As for laws of motion, objects in rest stay at rest, and objects in motion stay in motion unless acted upon by outside forces. Remember how geocentrists couldn't fathom the Earth moving and us not feeling it? Well, gravity and the laws of motion kind of take care of that. From there, our universe expands. Planets like Uranus were discovered in 1781 by William Herschel and Neptune later in 1846 by John Couch Adams. Probably the third most important John Adams. Other objects are discovered, like not planet Pluto in 1930. Since Newton, astronomy gets married to physics and calculus in an increasingly advanced way. And unfortunately, by the 1900s, we get into a territory that is far too complicated for me to comprehend, let alone explain, without a lot of time and research. So I'm not going to pretend that I can't. As an overview, though, theories of physics become observable in space through Albert Einstein, the theory of relativity, or Stephen Hawking and theoretical work on black holes. Principles seen in astronomy are worked out through complex math and are used in the 1900s to create satellites, space travel, and even put a man on the moon, probably. Observations are used to explain our origins and the movement of the universe with the Big Bang Theory. But more mysteries still remain and probably more are gonna be discovered that we can never dream of. But with the new James Webb Space Telescope and its predecessors like the Hubble, brilliant scientists like the ones of the past are learning more about space and the universe around us. And that's awesome.